Welcome to our discussion on the people and their elected representatives. Although members of Congress may make it a priority to represent the viewpoints and interests of their constituents, demographically speaking, they do not represent the American public at large. Congress, especially the Senate, is older, whiter, more educated, and more likely to be male than the population as a whole. That said, Congress is not designed to be a perfect sampling of American demographics. It is logical that the leaders of government would more closely resemble individuals who have achieved leadership positions in other realms, such as the corporate world and academia. Currently, in the House, there are 233 Republicans, 200 Democrats, and two vacancies. In the Senate, there are 45 Republicans, 53 Democrats, and two Independents, who usually caucus with the Democrats. If we are to look at this figure, it shows that most states have women as part of their congressional delegation. I'll show you another visual about that in a minute. But, but the proportion of women in Congress is not nearly equal to their proportion in the national population. In 2010, at least 70 women were elected to the House of Representatives, including 12 women. All of this information that I'm about to give you comes from the Congressional Research Service and it is part of a uh, report called Membership of the 113th Congress, a Profile. The average age of the members of the 113th Congress is among the highest of any Congress in recent history. This shows the average ages at the beginning of the 113th Congress. The U.S. Constitution requires representatives to be at least 25 years old when they take office. The youngest representative at the beginning of the 113th Congress is 30-year-old Patrick Murphy, Democrat from Florida, born March 30, 1983. The oldest representative in U.S. history, as well as the oldest current member of Congress, is 90-year-old Ralph Hall, Republican from Texas, born May 3, 1923. Senators must be at least 30 years old when they take office. The oldest senator in the 113th Congress is Dianne Feinstein, a Democrat from California, who's aged 80, was born in 1933. The youngest senator is 39-year-old Christopher Murphy, a Democrat from Connecticut, who was born in 1973. According to the Congressional Quarterly Roll Call Guide to the New Congress in the 113th Congress, law is the dominantly declared profession of senators, followed by public service or politics, then business for representatives, businesses first, followed by public service and politics, then law. <coughs> Table 2, that I'm about to show you right here, uses data from the Congressional Quarterly Roll Call Member Profiles to show the following occupations most frequently listed for members at the beginning of the 113th Congress. A closer look at the prior occupations and previously held public offices of members of the House and Senate at the beginning of the 113th Congress are as follows. 51 senators have previous House service. 102 educators employed as teachers, professors, instructors, school fundraisers, counselors, administrators, or coaches, 90 in the House, 12 in the Senate. Two physicians in the Senate, 17 physicians in the House, plus two dentists, two veterinarians, and one psychiatrist. There's three psychologists, both in the House, an optometrist in the Senate, and five nurses, all in the House. Five ordained ministers, all in the House. 33 former mayors, 24 in the House, 9 in the Senate. That's probably now 10 in the Senate, now that Cory Booker's in the Senate. 10 former state governors, all 10 in the Senate. And 8 lieutenant governors, 4 in the Senate, 4 in the House. 7 former judges, all in the House, and 32 prosecutors, 8 in the Senate and 24 in the House, who have served in city, county, state, federal, or military capacities, and 1 former cabinet member in the Senate. Obviously, the BAP is not going to ask you particularly about these things. I'm trying to give you some extra information. All right, so we're looking at um, Table 3, and that talks about education. Nope, excuse me, it talks about congressional service. The average length of service of members of the House at the beginning of the 113th Congress was 9.1 years, or 4.6 terms, and for senators, 10.2 years, or 1.7 terms. As of June 7, 2013, Rep. Representative John Dingell, Democrat from Mi Michigan, the current Dean of the House, has the longest service of any member in history, 57 years and counting. He began serving on December 13, 1955. At the beginning of the 113th Congress, 75 of the representatives, 17 percent of the total House membership, had first been elected to the House in November 2012. 
and 14 of the senators, 14% of the total membership, had first been elected in the Senate in November 2012, or appointed to the Senate in December 2012. These numbers are lower than at the beginning of the 112th Congress, when 21% of the House and 15% of the Senate were newly elected or appointed freshmen. At the beginning of the 113th Congress, 157 representatives, that's 36% of the House members, and no, had no more than two years of House experience, and 30 senators, that's 30% of the Senate, had no more than two years of experience in the Senate. This is the chart I was referring to earlier. This shows you the states in which there are um, female representation, and obviously you can see there are some states that are lacking in here, um, but most states are represented. Obviously California with the most, but they also have the highest population in the nation. Uh, next up, if you look at the 113th United States Congress at the party breakdown, you can see that there are more women that are in there as the Democrats than in the Republicans. And in the top part, right in here, that's the Senate. In the bottom part, that's the House. And we have a whole bunch of firsts in the 113th Congress. Um, I'll just hit a few of them. Um, we have freshman LGBT congressman people, um, first LGBT congressman of color, um, African or excuse me, Asian American Congress people. We have several uh, Latino Congress people. We have uh, four people in the Congress that were born in the 1980s, and then you have um, different religions. First Buddhist senator, um, only non-theist, uh, first Hindu representative, and only Unitarian Universalist. Despite the upward trend in increasing the number of um, people of color in the Congress, the United States lags behind many industrialized democracies with respect to the proportion of women serving in the national legislature. Similarly, African Americans have historically been underrepresented in Congress. To date, only five African Americans have served in the Senate. Now we have six with Cory Booker, including two Hiram Revels, excuse me, including two. Um, Hiram Revels and Blanche Bruce, who served during the Reconstruction era that followed the Civil War. After Bruce left the Senate in 1881, no other African American would be elected to the Senate until 1967, when Senator Edward Brooke, a Republican from Massachusetts, was elected for one term. More recently, Senator Carol Mosley Braun, a Democrat from Illinois, was elected in 1992 and served for one term, and Barack Obama was elected from the Senate from the state of Illinois in 2004. Today, the only African American in the U.S. Senate, outside of Cory Booker, is Senator Roland Burris, a Democrat from Illinois, and Cory Booker is a Democrat from New Jersey. Burris's controversial appointment to the Senate seat, formerly held by Barack Obama, came in the wake of a major corruption scandal involving the man who appointed Burris to the seat, then Illinois Governor Rod Blagovich, who is currently in jail. So if we look at um, this chart, this traces the increasing success of African Americans in getting elected to the House of Representatives. This m chart also shows that as in the Senate, African Americans' initial service in the House came about in the Reconstruction period. But the success of that era were short-lived, and the numbers of African Americans in Congress would not match those of the immediate post-Reconstruction period until after the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. Today, as in the case of women, more African Americans serve in Congress than at any other point in U.S. history. I'm going to give you some extra information from the Congressional Research Service. There are 45 African American members, that's 8.3% of the total membership in the 113th Congress. 43 serve in the House, uh, excuse me, m one more than at the beginning of the 112th Congress. 43 serve in the House, including two delegates and two serve in the Senate. Now that's three. This number includes one member of the House who is of African American and Asian ancestry and is counted in both ethnic categories in this report. All of the 43 House members, including two delegates, are Democrats, and the Senator is a Republican. Um, plus you have the Senator that is a Democrat, that's Cory Booker. Sixteen African American women, including two delegates, serve in the House. With respect to Hispanic and Latino members, there are 37 Hispanic or Latino members in the 113th Congress, which is 6.9% of the total membership. 33 serve in the House and 4 in the Senate. Of the members of the House, 26 are Democrats, including one delegate and the resident commissioner from Puerto Rico. 7 are Republicans and 9 are women. There are 4 male Hispanic senators, 3 Republicans and 1 Democrat. 
One set of Hispanic members, Representatives Linda Sanchez and Loretta Sanchez, are sisters. So let's have a summary of this chapter. In conclusion, Congress is an ever-evolving institution. The national legislature is shaped by the framers vision that created it, by the groups and individuals that seek to and do influence it, and by the broader electorate who vote for the representatives who serve in it. The Constitution's framers ingeniously created a strong legislative system designed to dominate the national government. In doing so, they simultaneously and significantly checked the power of the executive. Do the checks the framers created enable Congress to constrain presidential action today? The framers ensured that the legislative branch of the federal government would be responsive to changing times. Today, Congress is more demographically diverse than ever before in history. It has also responded to modern challenges by exercising a wider scope of powers, concerned with issues that were unimaginable even two decades ago, let alone more than two centuries ago. Congressional decision-making today is influenced by shifting constituencies in a country that is rapidly growing more diverse. How will continued increasing diversity affect congressional decision-making in the future? With Congress well-structured to respond to constituents' needs, ongoing technological advances, and the spread of cheap technology to more and more citizens mean that members of Congress and their staffs should be increasingly accessible to the people. And representatives, district offices will continue to provide constituents another easily access accessed channel through which to convey their needs and interests to their representatives, and through which through which their representatives in turn can monitor the opinions of their constituents so that they may better represent them. Congress has proved itself to be a remarkably flexible institution, responding to changes in society shifting constituencies, and increasingly diverse members, particularly in recent times. That Congress will become even more diverse is relatively assured. So the summary of the prezies that you've watched, the origins of Congress, congressional elections, powers of Congress, functions of Congress, the House and Senate compared, the legislative process, congressional leadership, decision-making in Congress, the legislative context, and the people and their elected representatives.